Can you believe it? The Slug Daddy is about to review a New Japan show. I know, wonders never cease. But lo and behold, welcome to my New Japan Global One USA Night One review. That's a damn mouthful. Goodness gracious sakes alive. Before I actually get into the matches, let me talk about a couple of issues that I had with this show just in general. I understand New Japan is making a big foray into the U.S. market, and you know, you're going to have some hiccups and you're going to have some mistakes, but first and foremost, did this show need to be four damn hours? Not every big event needs to go on this long. And it felt like three hours would have been more than sufficient for the night, especially with really some of the throwaway matches we had here. Not every show needs to be four hours, especially the big ones. And why is night two not going to be shown on Access TV until Friday night? Why? Is this a New Japan call? Is this an Access TV call? I don't know. I don't care. But it's kind of aggravating to me that... I watched night one only to find out as I'm watching night one that I'll probably find out all the night two results several days before I can actually watch night two. So that's aggravating. And again, I don't know whether it was New Japan, Access TV, a combination of the both, but the production of this show was substandard. It seemed like the commentators' mics were cutting in and out a lot throughout the course of the night. You had a couple of times where the commentators blessed their hearts. Um, didn't know who the hell was wrestling, so how am I supposed to know who the hell is wrestling, especially for somebody that is newer to the New Japan product? And furthermore, we did a horrible job in general of introducing the talent throughout the night. Not a lot of video packages, nothing in terms of any type of history explaining who this person is, what they're about. You just... A bunch of random matches is really what it felt like, and I understand that you're going to have the majority of your audience is going to be repeat New Japan customers. I get that. But you have to understand that there were also going to be people like me that were new eyeballs on the product. You have to get us invested in some of these characters. You have to educate us on who these wrestlers are, what they're about, and frankly, what your brand, your product, your show is about. And I thought this was absolutely fucking butchered. Pardon me again, it's late. Um, and I'm an old man. Well, this was butchered by whoever, New Japan, Access TV, combination of them, whoever it was. And all this talk about it being strong style, frankly, it did feel to me like this was more like a well-lit ROH show. Um, but with that said, unlike dumbass ROH, at least I didn't see sissy streamers being thrown into the ring every single freaking match. Plus, no commercial breaks during the matches. Nothing worse than taking a break during the action to say, this shit doesn't really matter. This was on TV. At least the network was willing to comply with allowing the matches, each of them, to run in their entirety before you got any commercial breaks. And I really, truly appreciated that. And frankly, usually I don't like intermissions for wrestling shows, but I was okay with it here. Let me walk the dog, get a snack, uh, take a leak. And give me time to come back and recharge for the rest of the show. So, there was some good in terms of the setup of it. But some of these things, frankly, were inexcusable. You have to do a better job of introducing your talent, your brand, your product, your show to the U.S. audience. Especially, potentially, new viewership in that United States audience that you are trying to kind of span out into. Um, but let's talk about the matches. The first match was a complete fuck-off, throw-away, fuck-the-young-bucks piece of shit. Period. It was complete fucking trash. Like, I tweeted about this, that Will Ospreay did this phenomenal flipping fucking move, and again, new to the product, I don't know much about him, I don't know much about the product itself, but this shit was spectacular, and instead of it being a highlight... Instead of it being something that was built up to, instead of it being something that we followed up, it was just another random fucking spot in the match. We couldn't bother to get to a pinfall attempt until the actual pinfall happened. Because, as is so often the case with the Bucks of Suck, it's all about getting in your stupid fucking spots, forget telling a story, forget trying to have any type of real tag match, Bullet Club chaos, this match was fucking chaos and not in a good way. 
I, at one point in time, was confused. Is this a tornado tag? Is this just ten men in the ring at the same time? Are we just having no rules here? Are we even bothering? Is this even really a tag match? This was complete and fucking trash. Period. And to me, this is a clear example of if you like this shit, then you just like nothing but flips and kicks. And if you like that, then go watch some fucking karate. You can mix in some flips and kicks and make it mean something. But of course, since the Young Bucks absolutely fucking suck, and they're overrated as shit, some people are going to defend this, and a lot of people are going to have enough sense to say, this match served no purpose. And it served no purpose. The only benefit about it is that it was the opening match, so we got it done and out of the fucking way. The second match, the eight-man tag, why we need so many damn tag matches on the show, I don't know. Probably we could have done away with one or two of them, frankly. Uh, but Team Takahashi and his weird masked fucking wrestlers that JR didn't know the names of. So again, why would I want to know the names of them? Why would I feel like I need to know the names of them? Against Dushin Thunder Liger and his CMLL crew, or whatever the fuck they are. I got to see Liger here. That's cool enough for me, frankly. And... I like the fact that these guys actually tried to work some semblance of a tag match, trying to get some type of heat, trying to get some type of hot tag, actually bothering to do tags. Vastly better than that disaster of a Bullet Club versus Chaos match. But of course, again, what would you expect coming from the Bucks of fucking suck? Moving on. So apparently there's this eight-man tournament to determine what is it, a new IWGP a uh, United States champion? Cool. Okay. Let me see who these people are that are in this tournament. First match in the tournament. You got Hangman Page versus Jay Lethal. Cool. Jay Lethal's got his ribs taped. Okay. So here's an example of the story is there. The way to get heat is there. The angle to work is there. The injury to work is already there. And we don't touch on it at all pretty much the entire fucking match. I don't give a damn if this is Japan style or not. This is stupid shit. You can make your match tell such a better story and really get the match over even better and make the match flow better if you actually sit there and deal with what is so obvious to everybody watching. I'm happy Jay Lethal won. I'm cool Jay Lethal won. I... Don't always like his finisher because there's such a high margin for error as there was in this case. And ultimately, again, because in wrestling, we always got to make sure we get all of our shit in. When he missed it the first time, we had to circle the wagons and come back and do it again. But this match was fucking stupid because we didn't bother to work pretty much at all. Other than when Jay Lethal occasionally remembered that his ribs were supposed to be hurt. We're hitting a dude in the neck and in the high shoulder area. And hitting him on the head, the neck, all this other shit. Everywhere other than his fucking ribs. A few less kicks to the head, people. And a little bit more actually bothering to tell a story in the freaking match. Would be nice. That's all I'm saying. But that's okay, because I quickly forgot about this one when we got to the Zack Sabre Jr. versus Juice Robinson match. I'm like, holy shit, C.J. Parker. He got better. He got quite a bit better. And... You know, initially looking at Zack Sabre Jr., the first thing, of course, that stood up to the Schlag Daddy was that it seemed like he was a little excited for this match, that he was saber-rattling, if you know what I mean. But all bullshit aside, imagine the basic premise and concept of actually trying to work a match and actually trying to work an arm injury and work it and work it and work it and build your entire match around it. When you do do something that's a little more high risk, you make it count. This was an awesome match, and I thought for a while that this was ultimately going to be my match of the night. But it was definitely one of the two matches that I really was impressed with out of New Japan on this Saturday night. This was one of them. This is one of these matches that I gravitate to. This is one of these matches where I say, this is why I would want to watch their next pay-per-view event or their next United States event. I might want to actually go to it and see it live in person someday. It's a match like Zack Sabre Jr. versus Juice Robinson. Hats off to both of these guys. This match was outstanding. Outstanding. And then we followed that up, and freaking, there's Yoshitatsu. Remember when we once got hashtag Save Yoshitatsu trending on Twitter, and he ended up addressing it, and they talked about it on Monday Night Raw? 
Oh, the glory days of the Off the Rope show. And Badass Billy Gunn, one thing that was striking when you saw Badass Billy Gunn is how big he fucking was and how jacked he was compared to everybody else in this match. You know, they did what they could with what they were going to do. I thought it was kind of weird that Tanahashi really wasn't that involved in the match. Um, that you've got Billy Gunn and Tanahashi facing off of that Intercontinental title, and they didn't really interact a ton. But hats off to Billy Gunn, even though he wasn't perfect here in terms of his match execution, for understanding he's going in, he's the heel, he needs to be the heel, even as a legend of WWE. And by God, he worked being a freaking heel. So the match itself wasn't great. The finish just kind of came out of nowhere and uh, kind of fell flat like a dud here. But I thought Billy Gunn was magnificent. And I thought a veteran like him understands what's called for at that specific time. And most importantly of all for him, as a real veteran, he understood he wasn't doing the job here, brother. So after this, you get intermission and I'm kind of like, eh. We've had one outstanding match, a couple of frankly clunkers, and just some stuff that's kind of aggravated and irritated me. And this show really needs to get back on track. And I was hoping this tag title match was going to do so uh, with War Machine and the Gorillas of Destiny. I was hoping it was going to. And one, one thing I want to quickly make note of is you've got Haku's kids, and they both look like wrestlers. I mean, they both look like dudes you would take seriously. They're good athletes. Uh, they've got a decent look. They've got that family lineage. There's all these things indicated that you can make money with these kids. And I reference specifically the WWE here. So you look at Haku's one son, who you called fucking Camacho. You tried to make him fucking Mexican for whatever fucking reason. The dude looks like a million bucks. He has a bit of a charisma and a personality to him. He can go a little bit in the freaking ring. Point is, I'm getting at, if you see Roman Reigns and you see money, how the fuck could you not see money in this kid? He has a million bucks written all fucking over him. Fuck WWE for almost screwing this kid's career up. Thank God there is a place like New Japan where this kid can go and not only survive, but thrive in professional wrestling. Um, I did think it was weird that we made this big deal about getting weapons involved in the match, and then for a lot of the match, they really they started off using the weapons immediately. Then for a long time, we went away from them. Then we came back once you got some Bullet Club bullshit uh, with the chairs. I was surprised that War Machine went over here, uh, but I guess, I guess it works out. Again, I'm not really that invested to sit, judge it one way or another all that much. It was an okay match coming out of the intermission. I thought... And expected it to be a little bit more, but it's not something I'm really going to complain about. Especially because it led into the next match, which is the unquestioned match of the night. And this is, and yes, I have seen both Okada and Omega matches this year. This match between Naito and Ishii was my match of the night, and it is my best match of 2017 that I personally have seen so far. There isn't a match that I have enjoyed more this year than this match tonight. This match, to me, was better than both of the Okada Omega matches. And some of that could be preference of style, but from beginning to end, I bought it. From beginning to end, I got into it. From beginning to end, I understood the story that they were trying to tell. When they're talking about on commentary how great Naito is, I can believe it. And then I look at Ishii and I'm like, you know, well, this is a bad motherfucker. This is like watching Taz if Taz actually had legit size and was a lot cooler. This match was freaking incredible. And even without a lot of emotional investment in this product, in this brand, in these wrestlers, in this tournament, when Ishii won, which shocked the hell out of me, I legitimately popped. That to me is the mark of a great match is where I don't know much about it going into it. I don't have much of a reason to care about it. But they did such a great job throughout the course of the match that they built me up to a point, me, the jaded, cynical, 30-plus years wrestling fan that I am, to a point where I legitimately marked out and popped when Ishii won this match. Like, I actually feel like now I've got my dude in the tournament in freaking Ishii. 
This match was outstanding. This match was incredible. And now that you were starting to get into the fact that we were two and a half plus hours into the show and I knew you were still going to have an Omega match and you were still going to have Okada's match as well, I started to get a little bit fatigued, frankly, because this match drained me so much emotionally at that time of night. Outstanding stuff. If, if you're somebody that doesn't buy into the New Japan bullshit and what a lot of the fanboy fuckboys, the Omega Cucks and everything like Meltzer say about it, if you're looking for a reason to justify why you would bother watching New Japan, you appreciate stories being told instead of all the flippy, kicky, pointless, we got to get in all of our shit shit. It's Zack Sabre versus Juice Robinson, and it is Naito versus Ishii. Those are the matches that you need to see off of this show, period. Outstanding work by these guys, but goddamn, Naito Ishii was fucking awesome and incredible. And then, of course, we follow it right back up with, <laughs> with whatever the fuck that's going to be, Michael Elgin versus Kenny Omega. This match was okay. Obviously, I thought both Okada Omega matches were better by quite a bit. You know, what, the thing that frustrates me about Omega's matches, that the ones that I've seen, and granted, I haven't watched all of them, but I've seen enough of them now to formulate at least some type of opinion, is when I watch a Kenny Omega match, sometimes he oversells, sometimes he undersells, and sometimes he sells the perfect amount. Sometimes there's a flow and rhythm to the match, sometimes there's not. Sometimes we actually bother to tell some type of story, but frankly, a lot of times we do not. Like, from my understanding is, Kenny Omega had never beaten Michael Elgin in a one-on-one -on -one match. And at no way, shape, or form, at any point in time, did I feel like that was the story we were trying to tell here. At no point in time did I feel like that there was any real threat that Kenny Omega wasn't going to win this match. And that's not the story that should have been told. I mean, ultimately, whether I'm an Omega fan or not, and I know there were tons of Omega cucks in the freaking audience, the point is... This guy was massively over with that crowd, period. Of course, instead of being the heel like he's supposed to be, he wants to be the cool guy and be a fucking babyface, but nonetheless, over is over, and the dude I cannot deny is massively freaking over with that crowd. So why not work the match in a way that could potentially get him even more over instead of just wasting everybody's freaking time and then getting to a point where he just crams a bunch of shit in and he wins and it's kind of lame. I'm sorry, this match was fucking lame. I figured as soon as this happened, because it was Kenny fucking Omega, everybody's going to overrate the piss out of this shit. And that's exactly what they did. How typical. I've seen better out of Omega, frankly. I've seen better out of Michael Elgin. This match was average to me at best. And it was nowhere near the match of the night. I don't give a shit what anybody says. I'll take Zaber and Juice Robinson any day of the week over this Michael Elgin, Kenny Omega match. And sure as hell we'll take Naito and Ishii over this crap. Now granted, it wasn't Omega's job, because he wasn't in the main event, to be the match of the night. But I did expect him to be a little bit better, because these guys have some history together. They have some chemistry, and it, it just never clicked for me. And then we get to the IWGP championship match between... Uh, Cody and Okada. And, you know, first thing that struck me, of course, was that if I was married to Brandy, and, and just, it figures, this is the wrestling business that we have today. We're worried about wrestling in Japan and winning our way to world titles and celebrating that. I'd rather celebrate Brandy being my wife and trying to put babies in that bitch whether she wants it or not. Repeatedly, over and over again. I try to put babies in her mouth, babies in her butt, babies in her ear, babies in her baby patch. It doesn't matter. I'd be knock, knock, who's there? Babies. Babies who? Babies in whatever hole I choose, bitch, that's who. But that's just me, I suppose. Uh, this match was okay. Um, I look at Okada, and I'm an Okada fan. I like Okada's work. I think he's really, really good in the ring. Even though it frustrates me that he overuses that freaking Rainmaker to the point where I don't buy it as a legit finisher anymore. And sometimes we get into a position with Okada where he has this bad habit of forgetting what we've been working at one point in time during the match. And we just stop working it all of a sudden. Or in this case, 
You have some Kinesio tape on Cody Rhodes' shoulder. We should have been working that at some point in time during the match, and instead we did nothing. This was good. Uh, I will say again that both Okada Omega matches were better than this one. Um, Cody was really over as a heel here. Okada was really over as a babyface here. And to me, there was a part of me that, and it's still kind of a part of me that thinks, maybe you should have had Cody win here. Have the American win on U.S. soil. You would have really gotten some massive heel heat on him. You could have sat there and had Omega then win this U.S. championship tournament, and you could have some building resentment, and you could, you know, cause all types of shit with the Bullet Club and all of that. But the way they ended up doing it, I'm okay with. Because you did have Omega come out, and the Young Bucks come out, and they try to get Brandy to throw in the towel. They threat, Omega threatens to throw in the towel, um, you know, distracting Cody and all of this, teasing that friction, teasing that split up, teasing that animosity. While I still think my way could have worked, I'm okay with the way they went, especially because it seems like they were determined to make this an Okada showpiece. And if they were determined to make an Okada showpiece out of this, then they did their job. That's exactly what they did. It's not the best match I've ever seen out of Okada. It's not even the best match I've seen out of him in 2017. But it was more than good enough to sit there and establish that, hey, this is our main event star. Hey, this is our big time clutch player. This is the franchise piece. And if you want to get into New Japan and you want to see something different and you want to get behind a guy, this is the type of guy that you get behind. You have them win, you have them win clean, and then you do follow-up after that. You even have Omega come out and talk about how it's not his night, it's his night, but that they've got their night coming up. You know, you're tying in Omega into this from a storyline standpoint makes all the sense in the world. But you're still managing to keep the shine on Okada and making him your big, bright, shining star. And I absolutely love that. I thought it was great. The main event was more than passable. It felt like a main event, even with that really bad botch in there with Cody and Okada at one point in time. More than serviceable enough, to say the least. In terms of how I would grade this show, surely because it has Okada and Omega, and it's New Japan, and some of the people that are going to grade it were actually there, which will skew the ratings, obviously, as it typically does. Um, I'm sure my grading will seem harsh, and unfair, but if you think about it, it's really not. I'd probably give it out of, on a scale of zero to ten. I'd probably give it about a seven and a half. And here's why: the show was too long. You had production issues throughout the course of the night. Uh, they did a horrible job of introducing me to these wrestlers, to these characters, and frankly, to the brand in general. With me being a relatively new customer for New Japan, unacceptable. They had to do better. And talking all this crap about Strong Style, like I said, it really did feel like to me, and I know others that were talking about it on Twitter, that it was just a better lit ROH show. That's it. But with that said, I appreciate the fact there's no commercial breaks between matches. Uh, Saber and Juice was great. Naito and Ishii is my match of the year for 2017. That shit was off the hook. Incredible. And they ultimately did what they could to make Okada this big shining star, all the while building future stories between Kenny and Cody and potentially friction within the Bullet Club and going there, setting the table for a future match possibly between Cody and Okada, all the while planting the seed for the big blow off the third match between Omega and Okada. There was plenty to like on this show, plenty that was just annoying. Fuck the Young Bucks, and I wish people would stop buying their stupid merchandise at Hot Topic and stop talking about these guys. Like, they're the greatest tag team that's ever been. They are glorified Mark Spot, spot Monkeys, excuse me, that don't have any business getting nearly the attention that they do. There are better wrestlers to support. But overall... There was enough here for me to feel like this show was worth my time. And come Friday night, I will be watching night two of this event, even though I will already know the results by then, and I will be coming back on here and reviewing this show. So it's a good initial foray for me 
overall for New Japan to the U.S. market. And I hope they do more of this in the future because it was a good way to spend a Saturday night.